And now for an exploding interview. Stay tuned. Welcome to an Explore Minute Interview Podcast. I am your host, Rob. And joining me for this week's episode is Sean. Welcome, Sean. Hi, man. How's it going? It's going well, man. I'm really excited to be here with Todd, the lead developer from Stutter Fox Studios and the man behind Falling Frontier. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for um, having me. And today I find myself outnumbered by Australians as Todd is also in Australia. What part of Australia are you from, sir? I am. I am in Melbourne. Awesome. Yeah, I've never actually been outnumbered by Australians on this show, so that's a bit weird to me. And it's even weirder to me that you're both in the future for me, in the next day. Time travel. Exactly. Time traveling Australians. Well, Todd, I was hoping we could start this episode by kind of getting a base knowledge of who you are, and if you could please tell me what your background is, and maybe how you end up making Falling Frontier. Sure, that, that's not a problem. It's a pretty broad answer, so I apologize up front. So I've always been passionate about games and more from just a hobby perspective, but understanding mechanics and systems and things like that. So I've always been designing games, um, at least from a pen and paper sort of perspective. Just when I didn't have the actual skills to actually do it, I would just draw and I would just sort of design how things might work. So I always did that as a kid in a school but when i had the opportunity in the university in the early 2000s so i'm showing my age i actually studied 3d animation for games film and television now back then there weren't any real dedicated courses for game development like they have now and in fact they didn't really have any specific courses for 3D animation like they do now. So that was a very interesting course. It, it combined 2D animation, 3D animation. It, it combined dancing and acting for uh, characters and things like that. And also a study of film and also storytelling and how to write a story and a script and things like that. So it was a very diverse course, but I majored in 3D animation. Unfortunately, out of uni, I didn't land a gig at any game studio. It was incredibly competitive, and there were a lot of very, very talented people that I just couldn't compete with at uh, the time. So I went into IT for many years, and um, just during that period of the time, I was just designing prototypes. I was just building prototypes, and then I, I actually had the opportunity, uh, well, just during that sort of prototyping phase to actually start working on falling frontier full full uh, time and so i was doing a full-time job as well as pouring about 35 hours a week into falling frontier and then i had the opportunity a while after that to actually make it my full-time job so my wife supported me in uh, that decision and yeah that's how i ended up making falling frontier full-time well, Todd, you mentioned not being able to get a job out of university, and I'm honestly surprised that the Australian game development scene was as big as it was. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? That's a really good question, and this might be wrong. I haven't done a lot of research into it in the last couple of, couple of years. I'll give you a from example. So back when I was sort of graduating to now. So back when I was graduating, well, just prior to it was quite big. Like there were lots of game studios in Brisbane, Sydney, and also Melbourne. And I believe that coincided around the time of government grants. So there was a lot of uptake for basically creating studios, but government grants, they changed because change of governments and all of that. So a short period of time, studios closed. And then over the years, it sort of moved into the more mobile development space so there's a few larger mobile game developers 
here. And I think there's even, I think even Electronic Arts has a mobile studio here in Melbourne. There's a handful of game studios as well scattered around the country, but it wouldn't be something that you would compare to like the States. It, it, it's much, much, much smaller. Having said that, though, um, different state governments have certainly uh, recognised the actual value in gaming and um, they're offering, I think, different grants for different size studios. So in the coming years, we might see that growth again, potentially into the larger studio space. But I think for the most part, it's pro- it's I think the majority of game developers here would be indie developers yeah, I'd say that's probably pretty accurate. Like, there's a few support studios around as well, like for bigger companies like Rockstar. But I uh, don't think there's not a lot of indie developers that I could name that operate out of Australia. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very true. And also, Creative Assembly used to have a support studio here in well, in Brisbane actually it was many years ago, but that got closed down. And I think the Rockstar support studio. Is it the Bondi studio in Sydney? I think might be wrong. I think um, it might be, yeah. Uh, off my dodgy memory, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And and they did a bit of work on LA Noir, I think it was. Right, yeah. I guess I just never really thought about it. I mean, I remember hearing about the Rockstar studio there, but I just never really I never really thought of Australia as like a development center. So that's great stuff. Now, would you mind telling me how long you've actually been working on Falling Frontier? Yeah, so from a coding programming perspective and sort of I I guess you would call the current build of on the game, I started the first lines of code for that in October 2018 and around about April, May 2019, I actually moved to that being my full-time job. Instead of just doing an extra 35 hours a week, I then moved to doing about 90 hours a week on Falling Frontier. But prior to that, from about... 2009 to 2012, I forget when it first started, I started doing prototyping of different game mechanics and how I might get them to work. I learned what worked well, what didn't work well. So that was sort of my fail fast stage where I would try a whole bunch of stuff and I would learn as much as I could. Because the best way to actually learn is to actually fail. It's not to actually succeed. If you succeed with everything, well, then there might be something that you actually missed. So um, I'm good at failure in that regard. <laughs> um, and I see that as a really good thing because I've, yeah, I, I, I learned what not to do. And that was always key to me before actually starting it professionally, that I had that period of time to actually find my feet because I'm a, I'm a self-taught programmer. I don't have any formal qualifications in that regard. Not that you really sort of underneath them these days, but for me, it was always important to have that time of learning and self-growth. Prior to that, I was basically designing Falling Frontier in one way, shape or form since the late 90s. You know, just pen and paper, as I said, before I had the actual skills to actually make a game, both artistically, well, artistically, programmatically, and also from a holistic design perspective. So yeah, since since about the late 90s, a long time, I guess you could say. So when you started working on Falling Frontier, was there anything in particular you took inspiration from, like other games or movies, anything like that? Yes and no. So from a design perspective, I knew what I wanted to make back in the 90s. I had this idea of my dream strategy game. And so a lot of the core mechanics have actually come out of that. Over the years, other games have have sort of come along and they've sort of touched on those different mechanics. So like a good example of that is like uh, Sins of a Solar Empire. You know, I think they did the multiple world concept well from a space strategy game. Homeworld had this amazing idea of world building outside of your sort of actual play space. You actually felt as though there was this bigger world. Conquest Frontier Wars was a great game for sort of introducing actual logistics, so supplies for ships and things like that. Nexus the Jupiter incident was great for, you know, just really highlighting the actual value of individual ships. And um, the one of my favorite games, Total Annihilation, I absolutely, I, I can't imagine how many hours I sunk into that. But the thing that that I took away the most from that game 
was the soundtrack. I mean, I mean, the gameplay was amazing, but the soundtrack, that was the first time that a soundtrack actually really hit me hard. And to this day, I still listen to that same soundtrack and I remember what it felt like playing that game. And so I really wanted to actually recreate that feeling for people playing Falling Frontier, which is why I reached out to Scott Buckley to um, write the soundtrack for a Falling Frontier because sound and music is so important. So th th those are sort of some game inspirations or games that sort of affirmed different characteristics as being quite good and also did those those are different game game elements really really well from a film perspective i mean you've got blade runner is just this amazing universe dune aliens you know starship troopers all you know it's like some big big large scale sci-fi worlds whereas some are a bit more focused and I always found those those two different types of storytelling really interesting and really wanted to try and incorporate both in a way, if I could. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a massive sci-fi nerd. So sit me in front of any sci-fi and I'll probably watch it just because just I just eat, eat it up, really. But yeah, those are sort of some of the standout inspirations there's many many others like we could talk about sci-fi film and games for hours and hours really yeah for sure scott buckley too his music is just phenomenal i didn't really know much about him until i started watching the trailers and i was like who's this and now he's on my spotify follow thing yeah he's amazing amazing guy such a talented artist and um and really 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 lovely bloke too he's really nice he's great to talk to he's great to work with Right. So my next question is, I mean, I, I know that Falling Frontier has a very strong base and real-time strategy, but we are primarily a 4X website. And it's pretty clear from the videos you've shown and the gameplay elements that have been talked about that Falling Frontier takes quite a bit of at least some influence from 4X games. And I'm hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, I guess the main kind of inspiration, well, I guess all of the all of the gameplay mechanics, in a sense, that are, are they're all RTS based. So they're grounded in RTS mechanics, but they've got a depth and a complexity that you would probably expect more from a Forex game instead of a standard RTS. So, I mean, to some of the most obvious ones around that, the whole idea of empire building and empire management, and other games have touched on that. Like I said, Sins of a Solar Empire. But that's probably the most common, well, that's probably the most obvious 4X style mechanic. But I mean, the ship, well, ship combat usually in 4X games, I've found personally, and feel free to tell me I'm completely wrong, but just the 4X games I've played, ship combat usually isn't overly deep. I mean, if we're talking about games like Stellaris and things like that, um, it's more about the grand world conquering or exploring. So although the ship combat in Falling Frontier is very deep, because of that complexity, I would say it still leans towards a depth that you would usually associate with the Forex genre. Like um, the research, again, is something that would lean towards the Forex genre more than the RTS genre. Usually, and, and there's always, always sort of exceptions, right? But usually like an RTS research tree is is fairly streamlined and doesn't branch out as much as whereas in a 4x game it does certainly branch out a great deal so Falling Frontier certainly leans towards that as well the pacing is also something that would lean towards more the 4x style it's a very well it's not a very but it it's a slower pace game it's a game that I would like to describe as a more intentional game you know, the actual decisions that you make matter. So it's certainly a slower pace game in the terms of your expansion, in terms of where you're looking to go next. The combat, though, can be very quick. So it can take a while to get there, but it can be over in a very short period of time. And then what you're left with is a cleanup of, of like escape pods and hulls and destruction, and you've lost all of these resources and you're crying in the corner, but it looks awesome because the ships are torn apart and you don't know how to feel, which was always something that I wanted to do as well, that, you know, things cost a lot. 
like a real lot and they take a while to build. So if you're going to lose it, you should lose it in style, which is always something that was important to me. So I guess those sort of main elements, the scale, the pacing, the research, uh, the empire management, although it is light empire management, it, 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 it does have long-term consequences. I guess those sort of main categories are probably the ones that you could draw very similar par- parallels to. Cool. From looking at what I've seen of it, I do really like that it's slower paced. It's like you're not frantically expanding and you've got your crazy fast combat and you're like, you know, your high APMs and all that kind of thing. Like I'm um, really like that it seems to be a slower paced sort of game. Regarding the setting, the in-game universe, what can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, I guess you might call some of it a little cliche. So I can tell you a little bit about the background story. So Falling Frontier exists in a future where, you know, the the classic sci-fi thing that Earth expanded out, colonized Mars, a bunch of other worlds, uh, the moon, out past the gas giants. And it's that age-old sort of history repeating itself that here on Earth, just whenever we've sort of expanded, uh, the colonies that have been established kind of want their sort of independence because they form their own identity at some point. So it was sort of that, I mean, it's cliche in a sense, but it's based on based on our own human history as well. So that's just kind of gone into the space realm, the solar realm. But there was this material that was discovered out at Pluto, and and that's where it's the most because it's the furthest away from the star, from um, the sun. And this material is is very strong, and it was needed to basically create super strong structures uh, that could withstand a great amount of pressure. It was also used for jump technology research so it became this sort of gold rush type material and of course that was pivotal to the whole uh, the whole uh, separatist movement of the outer colonies away from the core worlds because they were fighting over that material effectively that the outer worlds became this sort of sort of like work camps almost so people didn't have the best best uh, quality of life because this material was so valuable to research and everything so yeah that basically sparked this first colonial war and there ended up being a second colonial war as well a bit further on and then the different colonies kind of set off to different parts of um, the galaxy but not too far away from from Sol really so you're still like within our sort of main cluster and it kind of ties back into that whole thing that in the world of falling frontier multi-colony civilizations don't usually work out too well because once they get to a certain size they as i said they form their own ideology and they have their own way of doing things so um that's sort of history repeating itself in the falling frontier universe so the so the frontier worlds are it's sort of like the sort of the um american expansion into uh the west colonists just decide to just go out they take their their sort of uh world view with them and they set off into the stars and they try to claim land and do all of that sort of pioneering stuff and uh, the fundamental difference between the frontier worlds and the core sort of systems is that the that the population counts are a lot lower so therefore colonies don't form their own identities because they're still small they're basically like like small sort of uh villages which is which kind of makes people ultra important as well yeah so that's sort of the world of falling frontier that i can kind of share at the moment there'll be more coming though in the future yeah that's fair enough and it's believable too like you said you know this thing happens all through history and you can see there's all, there's so many people out there that compare it to something like the expanse because i think it follows a similar realism of expansion and and everyone forming their own subcultures i mean you're still doing your own thing but it's it's like i said it's very realistic because it's something that we have actually seen happen over and over again in history yeah history repeats itself yeah yeah history can be pretty real sometimes right and speaking of realism i know that falling frontier is considered to be pretty realistic and 
you know, relatively scientifically accurate, like, that gets grounded in science when it comes to things like, you know, faster than light and logistics. Would you mind explaining to us a little bit more about how grounded it is in realism and hard science? Look, that's a great question. That's always an interesting thing to to balance. I, I mean, like a lot of people have referred to Falling Frontier as hard sci-fi, which is fine. They're more than welcome to do it. I like to call it grounded sci-fi because ultimately with hard sci-fi, everyone's got a line that they draw that it goes from being hard sci-fi to, to just sci-fi, even with a show like Expanse, right? I mean, that's the epitome of hard sci-fi for a lot of people, but there's also aliens. And so for then a lot of people, it's like, nope, that's not hard sci-fi now. It's just sci-fi. So, so yeah, I like to, I like to say that it's grounded and it's grounded because it's familiar. And, and I think that's why people draw that hard sci-fi parallel as well also. So it's grounded because Falling Frontier has this concept of, of uh, physicalized resources that have to be moved around. Also, people, they get moved around as well. They are an actual resource. There's line of sight, which is, you know, something that people are familiar with. Um, like with just with their day to day walking around the world, you know, the line of sight, you can only see what you can see. As well as it's got these big starships that look like they've got weight. It looks like they they are slow and sluggish. And, and although a spaceship would be much faster, like like that's what it would be. Um, that's not familiar with what people see on Earth. So I'm I made specific design decisions to kind of help bridge that gap easily so that kind of lowers the actual requirement to actually understand things that are going on because people just understand that hey you know these things are big they're they are really heavy so therefore they must be really devastating or you know i've got fuel there but my ship's there so i've got to get it to that ship like they understand this stuff just naturally so those were sort of the actual decisions that i made when actually designing the game from a physics perspective like a physics simulation perspective the actual the weapon systems are actually physicalized so so the turrets do actually have to move they've got to uh rotate they've actually got to be able to line up with their target to actually shoot the actual projectile is physicalized in the sense that it's an object that actually exists in the world and it basically just travels along a path and it can bounce off of a ship it can hit the ship that it actually meant to that it actually meant to hit or it can miss and hit hit um, hit like a second ship or an asteroid it can punch through the actual hull and and there's actual projectile penetration calculations as well. So it's physicalized from that perspective for sure. Um, but there's no orbital mechanics and things like that. I did play with that in early prototyping, but I found that just from a gameplay perspective, that just creates an extra level of com of complexity. Um, not so much from a programming perspective it, it's relatively easy to do orbital mechanics that's that's not hard but then you have to design systems to actually support the player understanding where stuff is and things are moving and then you've got different zones and then ships have to orbit and all of this stuff and then how do you truly defend a world when it's moving around and it just adds all of these additional complexities which which i actually felt would actually reduce the popularity of the game because that was moving more into a simulation space instead of a rts space i don't know if i answered the question i apologize if i didn't yeah <laughs> okay great a roundabout way yeah i mean that's such a balance to try to create and to keep because you know in a lot of ways hard science just really isn't that fun and i feel like when you start to stick too close to hard science you you just take away from fun because you know, the faster and light stuff, you know, explosions and all those kind of things that happen in a game, you know, they wouldn't really happen in real life. So it's like, you know, you want to keep it close to reality, but you also want to keep it fun. Definitely. And, and, you know, like it's a game, so games should be fun. And if there's something there 
that so to my sort of philosophy is that gameplay should always win over over realism because it's a game it's not a simulation so that's sort of my sort of guiding light of you know if unless something is realistic and it gets in the way of gameplay get rid of it even if i thought it was going to be great and fun if i find out that it's not either because i play it and i think it's rubbish or someone gives me feedback well then it can go because it, it, it's going to be fun people have to love it yeah that's an awesome attitude to take like i, I was going to sort of say yeah you like it's realistic but what works within reason but you already said that so yeah being it's sort of kind of like an rts 4x hybrid like typically if you're going from the rts side as opposed to 4x usually your goal is you just expand out you get your resources you build your units and you beat the other player like defeat the other players as far as we know at the moment there's only the skirmish match against the ai it will be available in falling frontier when it launches how does a match normally play out in falling frontier so uh, the way that a skirmish match would play out is the player has one main nemesis opponent. So it's a one it's a one v one type in engagement, but there are plans to have sort of like sub factions that are more neutral, that are kind of things that get in the way for both of those players. They won't expand like the player would or the AI opponent would, but but they are territorial. So if you were to upset them and their sort of operations well then they will come and upset yours too because space is large and the star system is large i think to sail at sublight speed from one end to the other would probably take i don't know and this is working off my head maybe 10 hours maybe so it, it's pretty big for an rts so it, it, it might be more it might be less but that's just a pulling it out of the air kind of thing so a typical game would be you have to expand, you have to uh, do your intel because because there's no way you can know where everything is at a single time. And then you'll have to set up your supply chains, um, both in your sort of local sector and also if you're wanting to do any sort of beachhead kind of invasion into another sector, then you'll have to supply that in invasion because an army can only go as far as its stomach. So you've got to be able to feed your crew and everything like that as well. So ultimately, it does follow that whole expansion um, style gameplay and resource management and exploiting. But a player will also be able to select the size of the star system that, that, that they want as well. They'll be able to have a shorter game, um, so just around like a single gas giant with a bunch of moons or a whole star system um, just depends on how long they really want to play for because and this is just estimates but estimating a game could go from depending on the size of the actual map anywhere between two and 40 hours so it, it's definitely beyond a standard rts size game from a pacing perspective for sure but where those numbers land will ultimately be open to discussion with balancing and testing yeah so it might be less it might be more we'll wait and see yeah awesome i was just thinking with the what you're talking about with the having supply chains traveling with you and then the beachhead invasions i was thinking that reminded me a lot of uh, one of the games you mentioned before conquest frontier wars i think yes. that's the I mean, we've talked about this too, but it was the first RTS that I remember playing. I think it's the only RTS I've played, like straight RTS, that actually had any of that sort of supply line mechanics. Like you'd go mm. up to the wormholes and then you had to, you know, have to seal up that wormhole and then you'd have to breach through it. Yep. So, yeah, no, it's a really, really cool mechanic. And I'm glad that there's, that there are, you know, that there is a game out there again that's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it's a mechanic that I think if you're not careful, you can make a game a logistics simulator which is not what i wanted to do i wanted to have a game that that it was all focusing around the combat everything comes back to the combat about supporting that combat play style and logistics is a big part of that so i felt it important that it had its time in the sun but also shouldn't be something that you have to manage constantly it's something you've got to be aware of definitely and and there's something that can definitely cripple you and something that can cripple your um, opponent also. Well, Todd, my next question, and I, I want to kind of shift back to warfare here. 
but it doesn't seem to proceed at the normal, typical pace of an RTS. And, you know, I think that works really well because it seems like, you know, it's much more thoughtful, much more strategic, much more tactical. And, you know, I was hoping you could tell me what goes into kind of engaging the enemy. What what goes into, you know, creating the best scenario for your side? Like, you know, I understand there's intel gathering and, you know, maybe cutting off supply lines and stuff like that. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Good question. So intel is kind of key with uh, Falling Frontier. So intel is broken into into three separate categories. There's sort of um, the long range, there's short range, and then there is basically what your ships see around them. So the last one's kind of obvious, so we won't we won't really go into that. Actually, though, we might because I am I haven't built it yet, but I'm planning a feature that uh, one of the modules you'll be able to attach to ships is that it allows them to attach themselves to like an asteroid, so they can power down and be in an asteroid field and watch a flotilla go by and you know gather intel and stuff that way. So that's a valid local intel type mechanic. So going to a more localized intel mechanic spaceports which is your which is the primary hub above every world that a well that that you control that the enemy controls it's sort of the gateway to um the planet or on the moon uh they can launch uh recon probes and they'll send out bits of well they'll, they'll send out probes they will scan an area return data but there's a few in- interesting things with with probes so they will only give you the data of well firstly of that scan so that data stays there it doesn't move so if they pick up a ship and the ship moves away if you haven't scanned the new ship position you won't know that or even if you did scan the new ship position if you haven't double checked the old position you'll then see two separate blips so the data is based on upon what you last scanned in that area also probes can be discovered if they're if they're discovered a couple of things can actually occur the first thing is that the enemy um might find out the actual direction the probe came from and or they uh, they might actually destroy it and if they destroy it you you don't get the scan data but also probes can just fail for no reason as well. So you'll never know if a probe died because of an enemy ship or if it just failed because it was because it had a bad day. So then do you decide to send a second probe to actually check that area, which potentially gives further information to your opponent? And and it works both ways too, uh, with the AI sending out probes to scan for on the player, stuff like that. And a result of probes is that you get some suggested things you can do. So I call them operations. And these are sort of suggestions of, hey, we think we've found a flotilla here or a structure here or a world here. Perhaps you should check it out. You don't have to do them. You can turn them on and off. It's just a way to perhaps give a player a bit of guidance if they don't know what they should actually do next or things like what different avenues they could actually take. The last thing with the Intel is the long range. So there, so there's recon stations that can either do a 360 degree circle at a shorter range, which is still further than a probe, um, can actually travel, although probes will be able to be upgraded to travel further, or they can do a very long range narrow beam. So if you think you know where like an opponent is, well, then you can just point it there and just wait. Now, recon stations can act in one of two modes. The first mode is passive, where they pick up any jump signatures going in and out of their line of sight arc, um, or they can send out like a ping, a bit like a sonar. So that's an active mode, and it will basically return everything in that arc. But you also give away your actual position and also potentially the actual uh, position of of um, objects around the recon station. Also, when recon stations rotate and realign their actual beam because they are a physical space station and they've got thrusters and they have to rotate, they have to power down. And it, that takes time, takes time to actually rotate and takes time to power up. So that time might be five to ten minutes might be longer might be less i haven't balanced it but the point is you basically give yourself like a blind spot 
for a, a period of time. And also, I should finish by saying that both probes and recon stations work with line of sight, so they can't see past like planets and things like that. So if you want to put a secret flow tiller, you can put it on the dark side of a uh, planet. If you upgrade jump tech to be good enough, you could potentially m- maybe jump between the shadows of of um of um at different planets and and sort of move your ships around without being spotted stuff like that so it so yeah intel's important really important cool so first off that uh idea of the ship being attached to an asteroid like a prowler kind of thing sounds awesome and um one thing i was going to ask about all this stuff with your intel gathering and your radar and all that kind of thing you've had like real world naval personnel help with consulting on this haven't you well yeah so um uh I've got someone who uh, was a submariner for pretty much their whole naval career. So if I ever want advice or things like that, I can just ask them up. There are since some retired now, um, but uh, but yeah, they've 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 basically seen a lot. They've they know a lot. Um, so yeah, from a naval perspective, um, yeah, I've I've certainly got you know, like access to uh, someone to actually uh, give me any guidance when I need it. But again, it sort of comes back to that whole gameplay should always win over realism. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. But it's great to have that um, available as well so that you sure. have the realism, like the real knowledge to be able to find that grounding, grounding point between them. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 100%. Cool. So, Karen, going on with the naval aspect of it, how does ship-to-ship combat work? Yeah, so um, I touch on that a little bit. Um, so ships, uh, they move relatively slowly. Um, ships can be designed to um, have a whole range of different weapons, different internal modules, which will give different abilities, like being able to attach to like an asteroid or deploy a minefield. Um, there's projectile penetration. There's also ricochets, so rounds can actually bounce off and stuff like that ships have uh both enlisted crew and they've also got officers and officers can can be trained to have uh better perks which will actually buff the ship in a positive way if they get killed then it actually debuffs the ship or well it buffs the ship in a negative way um and they've also got enlisted crew who basically run the ship. The less of them you have, the less performant the ship becomes in a whole range of different areas. Ships have a bunch of their own local resources. So other than officers and enlisted crew, they've also got fuel, which is used for jumping. Ships can sail forever without fuel but they need fuel to jump they've got munitions which are used for firing of any weapon and for some special abilities like uh deploying like a um uh, deploying a minefield and they've also got food so if they run out of food then then they starve and the ship is disabled and it just floats away um so ships have multiple states um and multiple hit boxes so i think on average a ship has like maybe 20 hit boxes and internal components so internal components can be compromised through projectile penetration so like a good example of that is like ship engines if the engines get hit then that'll affect its ability to actually sail, which might actually also affect its ability to jump because for a ship to jump, it has to be facing its destination w- within five degrees of um, of rotation. So if a ship can't pivot, it can't jump. So you might be in a bit of, bit of trouble there. Uh, the combat's supposed to be fairly visceral. It's supposed to be something that even smaller ships can can actually take on a much larger ship. So the so larger ships can carry larger weapons, which will do more damage, but they're also heavier, so they take longer to actually rotate. So a bunch of smaller ships can actually get in there and really harass a much larger ship. Um, so smaller ships are always valuable. Plus, also s- smaller ships can uh, carry um, like point defense weaponry stuff like that to shoot down missiles and other things 
So it's always good to actually have a decent composition for any kind of in, in engagement if if uh, if um if you can. Um, I was also speaking a bit about hitboxes before. There's also a munition storage hitbox that, if struck, there's a chance that the ship might have a immediate combustion event. So it goes boom. It's very rare, but it can happen. So a frigate could technically one shot a battle cruiser or a cruiser. It's rare, but there's always this element of risk with combat. So even though you might have numbers, you might have the weapons, you could still lose because that's the way the world works. Like just because you've got that doesn't mean that you should win. History is full of lots of examples where where a smaller group, you know, outclassed a much larger group. And I and I wanted to actually uh, replicate that as well, um, just within Falling Frontier. So so ships take a lot of damage. So even just a, like a few seconds within combat it potentially could cause massive damage to uh, to a ship internally. Like a shot could go straight down, like damage the actual jump drive, and 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 then a ship can't actually jump away. So that combined with with uh, with logistics and local resources for ships actually prevents this whole idea of like a rolling stack of doom that can just jump in, destroy stuff, jump out, destroy stuff, jump in. That that gameplay just doesn't work. So that's why I call it a very inattentional game because when you commit to a combat action, you are committed. It's rare that you'll be able to actually retreat. I mean, you can try it, and you can, but depending where you are, if you're in like an asteroid field, you can't jump out of the center of like an asteroid field. You have to sail to um, the very edge first before that. So, so depending upon where you are, you might be completely invested. Um, so, if you, so even if you win, you'll probably have a few ships that are banged up a great deal. So, what do you do with that? So, so ships have crews that can actually repair the uh the uh the ships to a certain percentage but and that allows them to become operational for all of their sort of components but you might want to send them back to a shipyard to actually have a proper repair so then how far away is that actual shipyard do you sail there at um at um at, at like a uh, sublight which might take 20 minutes or do you or do you jump there if you if you jump, it might be picked up by, you know, like an enemy scan. Once you're there, then then you've actually got to dock the ship into the shipyard and it takes time to actually repair. And you can't build ships out of the actual build slot that the damaged ship is actually docked in. So you then have to choose, well, do I stop building new ships if you can afford them? Or do I repair my older ones? That's going to consume, you know, build slots. So there's all of these tactical decisions about what comes out of combat. Combat's absolutely devastating. And also with the crew, because crew die through combat all the time, a lot. And you actually get taxes from all of your citizens. So both those on planets and those in space. Those in space get a slight tax cut because it's dangerous right but if you lose say three ships that might be 15 15,000 citizens that's a lot of income to lose so combat has economical impacts just outside of the loss of actual resources you will then lose taxation as well Todd, I really like the emphasis on citizens and how important they play a role. I didn't realize that you would even have, you know, them play such an important role with regards to fatalities in ship combat. I really like that. Now, you've mentioned quite a few different ship types, and I was hoping you could tell us about how many types of ships will be in the game. So the total number of ships, the ship roster that I'm planning is around about 20. Um, the majority of those will be combat related, um, but... Then so, so those are broken up into frigates, destroyers, cruisers, and battle cruisers. So there's no battleships, there's no carriers. They don't they don't work within the world of a falling frontier. Just from a combat 
tactics perspective, a cost perspective. But there's also civ- there's civilian ships like construction ships, uh, mining ships, refueling ships, uh, resupply ships, and also potentially a couple of others like like scout ships as well. Well, I mean, scout ships are going to be more the military type, and those are more about module composition than dedicated chassis type. But yeah, that there might be a couple of other civilian ships that I haven't spoken about yet, but not prepared to speak to just just yet. Yeah, that's fair enough. So you mentioned before that there is that there's going to be a tech tree when we were talking about the mechanics. What was that likely to consist of? Like you're talking stat bonuses, like new weapon types, new buildings, that kind of thing? Yeah, so um, there will be some structures that are unlocked from that. Um, Also structure upgrades. So like a good example of that is a shipyard. Um, So allowing your shipyard to actually build larger ships Um, and also to support things like potentially, you know, to put uh, turrets on your shipyard or perhaps a longer line of sight and um, or perhaps a shipyard can, uh, can, uh, can actually store more um, more um, resources and, and um, things like that, uh, as well as uh, different uh, ship chassis, ship weapons, uh, different modules, uh, different colonization options. So different world types you can actually colonize. There, there will also be uh, different, um, different uh, things like officer perk. Well, you know, I'm um, just uh, training paths for different officers that can be unlocked, and also a few other things as well. But it, it's really diverse. It's a diverse list of uh, of research options, which which will which will give players a fairly large uh, scope of how of how they sort of want to play. Man, Todd, I'll tell you what, I've gone into this podcast being pretty excited about Falling Frontier, and at this point, I feel like a giddy little schoolgirl who can't wait for it, because this all sounds really great, I've got to say. Uh, thank you. Well, Todd, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to tell us about Falling Frontier and answering some of our questions, and I do want to mention that the recent trailer you put out before E3 was amazing, I really liked it. And I look forward to speaking with you more at E3. We have, you know, a, an article coming with regards to what you're going to be showing off. You and the rest of Hooded Horse are going to be showing off at E3. So I'm really looking forward to that. So thanks again, Todd. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much. I certainly appreciate you guys taking on the time to just ask questions about the game, to find out a bit more about it. And hopefully I've answered a few things that were question marks. And yeah, I look forward to showing you guys a lot more. Yeah, it's awesome. I think for a lot of us, it's on like in our list of games that we are most excited about this year. It's way up there, and with how open you've been about development, like answering all everybody's questions and telling everyone how everything works, like it just it just builds it up even more because you know, like with how open you're being, you know that you've already made these things or like you you know how to do it, and there's a lot of confidence in your ability to make it a great game. Oh, thanks so much. I um certainly appreciate the kind words. It's a it's actually really humbling just um how just how much interest there actually is in uh, falling frontier you know i mean i always wanted to create a you know like a, a big game but yeah it's just really rewarding just to see people thinking that your ideas are cool <laughs> because you never quite know um so yeah it's really really humbling so thanks so much guys absolutely and we'll be seeing you soon at e3 looking forward to it Our pleasure, Todd. I really appreciate it. And again, thanks for being here. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. This was Rob, Todd, and Sean for Explorinate. Until next time, keep exploring.